Sunday scripture we're back on breakfast. It's a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday morning reaching live from our studios in Victoria Island, Lagos. My name is Kofi Bartels. And I am Messi Bopo. It's good to have you back <laughs> on site. Yeah, merci indeed. Um, like they say in our local parlance, but you know, be good. But, <laughs> exactly. um, yes, we, we, we enjoy divine help. I guess it's great to be back. You're looking uh, fantastic as Thank always. You. Thank I you. I can see the new hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's <yes>. fine. <laughs> that's okay, but I think you're a bit late, but that's fine. Yeah, My well, name is Messi Bopo. And as always, we start off our conversation with a top trending. Uh, so I'm sure that you saw the video that made the round. Uh, there's a video, uh, not necessarily a video, but a picture talking about the Navy destroying illegal bunkering vessel. And that has been, you know, uh, generating a lot of reaction, all thanks to the new sheriff that's in town. So at some point now, I'm sure that the conversation would be whether or not, should we be angry that we have a new sheriff that's not, uh, you know, that's a private sector, uh, you know, sheriff or yeah. whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it feels like at this point, a lot of persons are very excited, uh, you know, with the development and the result. But quick one, the operatives of the Nigerian Navy in Delta State had destroyed an illegal oil bunkering vessel arrested with stolen crude oil on board uh, that happened on Monday. Uh, you can see the pictures, uh, like I rightly mentioned, you have a new sheriff in town. The oil pipeline surveillance company led by Tom Polo uh, affected the arrests of that vessel alongside seven member crew. Uh, that's on October the 6th, 2022, while the crude oil was being loaded illegally into the ship. But long and short of all of this is that uh, they had laid ambush for this particular, you know, vessel, as you can see it. According to, you know, the consultant uh, that was available, his report, his testimony was that uh, this particular vessel has been transporting. It's not the first time. It's a Dutch vessel that's registered, that belongs to certain Nigeria. But, of course, that has not been disclosed to Nigerians. So we really don't know who owns this vessel. And so on this certain day, they actually, you know, waylaid them in the street palace. That would be the word. Laid an ambush and they were caught. But surprisingly, and that's gotten too many persons angry at the time where we're thinking that, hey, first of all, we have to grapple with the fact that uh, how did we get to this point where uh, you have... Uh, pipes or, you know, different spots where people are tampering with the pipeline and then taking this vessel. However, this vessel was headed towards Ghana. That's also another conversation. Somebody said we have brought our Ghana brothers into all of this. Uh, that's, that, that was the case. But um, what has gotten a lot of people, like I mentioned, Nigerians have been reacting in and out, uh, is that the Navy destroyed this vessel. You know, they just set fire on it. And so there are a lot of questions. So, setting fire on this vessel, we know that this is illegal. Someone is actually stealing from us. Why do you have to put fire on it? Um, did you set fire on it while you still have, you know, the crude oil in this vessel? Uh, was the crude oil taken out? Uh, you know, you have members of the crew that, of course, said they were arrested. Should we have acted differently? Why exactly did this happen? Now, what will happen with the investigation and evidence at the end of the day? Who does this vessel belong to? These are some of the questions that are begging for answers. And we're hoping that, you know, the government would actually provide answers. However, you will also have, you know, uh, a chieftain of the region. Edwin Clark has come out to say that the government needs to set an investigative panel, a panel of inquiry. Some people think that that's not brilliant. But it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to grapple with. It's quite saddening at this point, especially when we turn 62. Yes, indeed. Messi, you, you've, you've actually said, you know, said it all, um, uh, especially the wonderful background you've given there. This seabaring uh, uh, sea or sea barge, seagoing barge that was uh, intercepted. Um, you know, the, the, we've had a lot of reaction to the... Uh, federal government given this pipeline surveillance contract to uh, government Ekwemupolo, aka uh, Tompolo. Let me say chief government Ekwemupolo. I mean, some people ask why is it called government, but that's his name. Um, and uh, General Tompolo has since swung into action with his company, uh, Tantina uh, um, um, Security, Security Services. Services. Um, uh, and uh, one of the initial casualties being this, this uh, sea-going barge, uh, which you know was intercepted. Uh, what what he he's saying uh, is that see, 
the people, well, the company is, is basically just a, an intelligence gathering company. And what they do is they gather intelligence and then they hand everything over to the security agencies. And of course, like you said, uh, Nigerians coming out to, to ask, you know, uh, questions about the methods of the, uh, the armed forces, you know, uh, in, in terms of the burning of this vessel. It, it's quite interesting to see people asking questions, you know, okay, uh, someone told me yesterday, this is uh, evidence that it shouldn't be tampered with. It's like burning the evidence, you know, the economic and financial crime should have been called in uh, to take that vessel as evidence and to investigate, uh, because according to them, it's an economic crime um, to, to steal crude oil. We also hear there's an allegation that 25 million naira was offered to those who intercepted this particular barge, um, at which they promptly rejected. 25 million naira was, uh, was offered to them as a bribe to allow the barge proceed on its activity. Uh, unfortunately, or let me say fortunately for, for Nigeria, unfortunately for the operators of this barge, the, the bribe was rejected. Uh, Tumpula has said a lot in recent times, you know, uh, the fact that uh, uh, that that he, he's out to prove a point. The fact that you know he's out to ensure that you know he supports government to rid the country of um, crude oil theft. The fact that Nigeria is losing a lot of money um, uh, to crude oil theft. Uh, he also said in one interview I watched that uh, the government may not survive 2023 if nothing is done to nip this in the bud. But he also went on to say that uh, those within the Niger Delta who may be involved in artisanal refining are not really the main guys. The main guys are the ones who uh, come with the big money, with the US dollars, they come with their equipment and their, uh, and everything, you know, to the place. The people you see from the Niger Delta are basically foot soldiers. I've also seen, you know, some interviews with uh, uh, artisanal refiners, uh, you know, saying, you see, we're just doing the little one. If one of them said in Delta State, said, uh, or by outside state, I think, said that he's just doing, uh, was doing small, you know, the connect pipes, um, you know, from the main pipelines and they, they cook the oil, what you call coal fire in parts of Niger Delta, you know, they get diesel, they get kerosene, they get sometimes kerosene, a petrol, PMS. Um, he's saying that what they do is just a little fraction of what the main guys do. Uh, it seems what Tom Polo and his, his company are doing with this contract is to see how they can buy, get a buy-in of the, uh, the communities, you know, host communities. Um, and I think also that's the government strategy, get the buy-in of the host communities to say, okay, instead of doing this little one, uh, take this contract, work the pipelines for us, and help us catch the big players who have been engaging in this. You know, but the question always remains, uh, can such a vessel ride all the way into the waters of Nigeria? Okay, I mean, this vessel is a barge. Um, can it take the crude oil, steal it, and, and ride out? into the high sea to load it off to a, a, a tank, a petrol tanker, if you, a crude oil tanker, just like that, without being seen by the security agencies. We have the Navy on the waters, you have the Army around there, you know, even the Air Force, that's just called that. Without being seen by any of these guys, GTF are not aware, nobody is aware. That is the question, you know, um, people are asking. Uh, I mean, I've listened to the likes of Femi Fallon, uh, Messi, you know, in a speech and recent speech he gave at the Labour Party uh, retreat where he really made some quite, quite um, very deep, he shared some deep thoughts and ideas as to complicity of government in saying it's really impossible for the government of Nigeria not to be aware that this is, go this is going on. So, so the question is, can such a, a badge uh, or any other vessel for that matter be involved in crude oil theft without the authorities doing. But I think that the, the follow-up to that is that the NMPC um, Limited, NMPCL's group CEO, uh, Mala Melikari, led other officials of the NNPC and the chief of, um, of, of army staff, of defense staff, um, uh, General Lucky Rabo, into the creeks. And the pictures uh, were everywhere yesterday where they went to inspect a site uh, on a portion of the trans escravos pipeline uh, where crude oil was being tapped. In fact, according to the managing director of Tompolo Security Agency, who spoke to Pressman, he said that they identified at least 16 tapping points on the trans escarose pipe, uh, pipeline. And in general, they found um, um, more than 50 uh, um, uh, insertions. So what they do is you have the pipeline, and they, these people get uh, have um, pipes that are 
drilled into the main pipeline to suck oil out. Now, some would say, okay, that's really dangerous because, you know, before you uh, embark on such a, an activity, an exercise to drill, all right, holes into, into and intercept oil, you know, from the main pipeline. So you have to be careful because when there's pressure in there, if you try that, it could lead to an explosion. So now this raises concerns of uh, a collusion from people within the oil and gas community from um, companies, for instance, SPDC or what we call Shell. In fact, what they found out was that this particular um, uh, uh, um, tapping point, you have two pipes that were placed on the trans escovers pipeline and were sucking the crude oil from there. Um, all the way, four, over four kilometers, over four kilometers, into the high sea, all right, Messi, and you had a platform, uh, a loading platform, on the water. You have to get into a speedboat to get there. That was is operated by Shell, and they, they they pump this 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 pipe, this guy, this crude oil, over four kilometers to the pipeline that is on the high waters, a platform where you have a helipad to access there. You have to be on a speedboat you know, ride for some time to get to that platform or use a helicopter and you see like it's a high is the high sea. So so, so so what they discovered, Mercy, was that 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 this this pipeline has been operating for nine years. Now the question people are asking is how can such a pipeline, all right, that is is sucking and stealing oil from the trans escovers pipeline, uh come how can such a, a pipeline exist within the country for nine years and nobody knows about it. And and not just that, it actually goes all the way to the high sea, and they're using a shell platform, um, you know, to, to, to load into vessels. So the questions are, are, are quite enormous. Really. Yeah, so so I think that that's, you know, uh, if you look at you know, the movie production in Nigeria, the some they say this is uh, part one or season one. That's like the beginning of the conversation. And this is also, you know, the second part of the conversation where you say, okay, yes, this is what's going on. Uh, there's an illegal pipeline that has existed for nine years, and it feels like we just woke up to discover all of that. But another one that's pressing is the issue of you having the uh, the vessel that was set ablaze, you know, that just bought the vessel by the Navy. And that also is where the conversation lies. So it's like we're having the conversation in parts and you know, bits and pieces or in parts. So part one or series one, and this is another season. At the time where one would think that should it be? Because if, if, I mean, if you have crude here, I'm just asking, if the vessel had crude in it, was it really rational? Was it a wise thing to do, you know, to set it on fire and just spawn it? We're not also talking about the implication that that would have, you know, around the environment. Let's not forget that this region is a region uh, due to activities of, you know, the international community. I mean, uh, international companies suffered a lot of environmental degradation. And now that's happened. Let's also not even think about, is it not possible that we could have made money from it, sell it, you know, take out yes, the crew yeah, we, we, and we, restore we, it? But this yeah. is the, this we, is the reason question. The reason I raised the, the pipeline, because that's really, like, really very, very latest, which is just a discovery. Um, for, for, for the vessel, I mean, it, it's, it's unfortunate, like you said, um, some have talked about, you know, burning the evidence. And for me, the, 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 my greatest concern was the impact on the environment. You know, um, you have people who can swear on their parents' grave, I'm sorry to say that, that um, uh, the, in fact, Tom Polo said it in an interview granted one of the TV stations. He said that, you know, the, the military and the Navy, the Army and Navy, they are, they are really involved in this. And that um, if you see a, a, an Army boat, a JTF, you see a Navy boat on the high waters, you will know that there's something going on behind there, mm. you know. So, so he, the, the allegation from him is that oh, when they, they, they get their monies, all right, the, the, you know, the, the bribe and they paid off. They look for one old vessel to burn and they'll send a report that so, they so burned that's, something. So that's like a setup. Uh, uh, yes, you know. <laughs> but, but for this, this is, um, is a flash in the pan because, because you know, um, how, how do these things go on without, without being, being noticed? It's, um, uh, Mele Carey has gone to the creeks. He, they wore raincoats, you know, they took pictures. Uh, Lucky Rabo was with him. And they expressed surprise that this was going to be a surprise. Nine years, to be able to drill. Kofi, we need to move you on. Know? You know, I, so, I feel like so this conversation let's is, see. is something that we would let's have see. to, you know, let's talk see. about. Let, let's see how it goes. And it might never be endless. Let's see how it goes. So over yeah. to you. But I, I do hope that, that SPDC or the shell, whichever of the shells it is, you know, because I have different shells, will come out and tell us how the platform, you know, uh, that they have 
is being used, you know, uh, that's an offshore platform, it's being used to, uh, to load the stolen crude into the ships, you know, the vessels. We've been waiting for them to come out and tell us. But anyway, uh, moving on very quickly, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trending, you know, hashtag on, on Twitter that uh, uh, has to do with education. And this is Save Ma Poli. Ma Poli. For those who are wondering, Ma Poli uh, is uh, the acronym for the Moshida Biola Polytechnic. And what we're seeing is that students are taking to Twitter and other social media platforms to express uh, their displeasure at uh, what they call illegal increment of tuition fees. You know, they're saying that um, they've been suffering this and as if it's not enough, the school came up with uh, another 20,000 Naira tagged as registration fee, uh, asking who does that. This is a, a school located in Ogun State, um, where Governor Dakpa Abionu holds sway and uh, you know, students are not taking it lightly at all. In fact, they say at the acceptance fee, I don't know if you've heard of acceptance of fee, Mercy, before I, 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 uh, acceptance fee. What is acceptance fee? was the, raised from 25,500 5, 25, naira uh, to 35,000 naira. As if that was not not enough, they added another 20,000 naira uh, to it. And a group known as um, uh, Fund Education Coalition, they're kicking against uh, the hiking fees by the Moshoda Biola Polytechnic. Um, it's a student's group. Uh, they are saying that um, uh, the action of, of the management of that school was insensitive and ill-conceived. They are saying that uh, Governor Dapo Abiodun of Ogun State in southwestern Nigeria should be asked some hard and serious questions as regards the funding of the institution. Have you heard of acceptance fees before? So a uh, uh, acceptance fee is that fee when you're given an admission. I mean, for instance, you apply... You know, to I know you know what this is, but I would just explain because you you're acting like you don't know, and so for you to accept the admission, you have to pay a fee, like saying, "Hey, you know, this admission has been granted." You pay a certain fee to say, "I have accepted what, what this admission." What exactly is, is is that meant to do? You know, I don't I, understand, but that's what it is. Know, so you pay a certain um, fee. You've you've gotten an admission, and for you yes. to proceed with mm. every other thing, you need to you know put down a certain fee. That's that's usually a fee. So, so I remember at the yeah. time where. Uh, you know, University of Calabar, to be precise. Even that particular system even creeped into those who were interested in having their masters. I really don't know where that came from. There's a lot that happens at the university, at the federal and at the state level. But like I would say, I know that you're eating you know, to say I, something. I mean, in my, in my time, <laughs> the, the, the acceptance fee, there was anything like that may have been so insignificant that we didn't even notice, I didn't even notice. So times are changing. We're in 2022 and you're talking about your time. We need to go back in time to understand. Excuse but me, you're making me feel old, like uh, Queen Elizabeth bit, said. You do have a bit of grey hair around, and, and that's not... That's so, not, <laughs> so, what's that supposed Kofi, to mean? that's on the side, but <laughs> to be to be yeah. very honest and, you know, to look at the issue, uh, is that financing has been, has always been an issue, especially with our education. And if you look at the educational system in Nigeria, uh, it's underfunded. It's not properly financed, whether the federal or, you know, the state uh, educational system or institution, however you want to look at it. But it's just that the structure itself originally allows that, you know, basic education in Nigeria is financed through the concurrent financing structure. And so you have uh, the three tiers of government, the federal government, the state government, and the local government. And at the end of the day, there's supposed to be a percentage. So you have the federal government committing you know, 50%, and then you have uh, the state and local government committing 30 and 20% respectively, and that's what it is. But let's even get back to the issue of, you know, how state governors, because I remember sometime last year that ASU had raised a serious concern about, you know, not funding for, uh, you know, uh, state governors, not funding state institutions or state universities. It was a serious concern that has been raised. Some universities were actually, uh, you know, highlighted or pointed to the fact that they were not leaving up to expectation. And we're talking about universities in this course. And so it, it, it's just uh, a lot. But the argument that's been put out, you see students complaining, especially for the Mushuda Biola uh, Polytechnic right there, if you look at the times, one would ask, should the management of university not be very uh, realistic? I mean, be in the system to understand exactly what's going on with the times. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about a state, you know, at a time where civil servants 
almost in that state, some of them are talking about salaries not being paid. And then you have their kids in that school. So how do you then explain it? <laughs> so I have a word. I work in that particular state. Salaries are being owed. How do I then pay for it? And if you look at the cost of living and everything, it's on the high. So one would think that the government should be sensitive. But however, there's no statement from uh, you know, the management of the school at the time to you know, debunk all of the issues that are really going on. But funding is an issue. And I know a lot of persons have said, oh, let's you know, get into a system where we have the private sector, we need to privatize, or we need to hands off. Government cannot continue. We talk about the fact that we don't have funds and funding. Well, let's look at the budget every other time, at the state and at the federal level. Let's look at what we keep, you know, where we're uh, locating monies to and resources. What are we spending monies on? Is it important that we look inwards and begin to cut the excesses? You find, you know, uh, in a state, you find a governor running a convoy. It's not a joke. So you have about 19, a certain brand, you know, I was going to mention a brand, but you have a certain, you know, cars, a fleet of cars, which would actually constitute the convoy for, you know, a governor of a state. What are you doing with all of that? That's it. And for all of these vehicles, these vehicles will not drive themselves. So you, you're going to have, you know, people who are driving these vehicles, you're going to be fueling and maintaining these vehicles. All of this. It's, it's, why are you laughing? I'm saying something. No, no. But it's true now because we can't, we, we, you know, you so the, government, you, the governors will say we don't have monies to fund the system, you right? Watch, you watch a lot of TV. <laughs> Basically, we, have, we don't have too much time. Of course. Yes, let's get to the last. Um... So, um, very uh, the last on us for us this morning is that the army has actually intercepted, you know, cannabis worth 4.9 trillion naira in Yoruba State, and it feels like we're at the point where the fight against drug is on the high. And this is really good. I mean, we're approaching the election period. Uh, I'll, Please, I'll... I, I hope you're not going to say that this is political. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I put out a tweet, I think a couple of weeks ago, when there was a fight in Iyanaoba, in, in Lagos State. Um, is it Iyanaoba? Yeah. Where I said, okay, um, maybe NDLEA should lend or should we just maybe put the way we put it in this part where she borrow <laughs> um, <laughs> a Mara to Lagos State for for just one month, you know, mm. and all these things to learn. But um, I'll just analyze this looking at what people are saying. And the average man on the street out there will, is saying, um, just a few months to election, they are finding cocaine everywhere mm. and they are finding pipelines. So, in other words, you're saying this are, is political? I'm not saying, I don't think it's political. I think um, the man is doing a good job. I don't think it's political. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go, Messi. We well, that's it. Go. That's the much we can take this morning. <laughs> I don't know why you're top laughing. Uh, well, we will return tomorrow with more interesting conversation. We we'll take a break now, and when we return, it'll be time for us to go through the front pages of the national dailies. We we'll call it off the press. Please stay with us.